Hi. I'm so happy to get to talk to you. I know. Look, look at what a professional space I'm in right now. I'm sorry. Are you not seeing my messy kitchen behind me? I mean, come on. I am like living the podcast dream. <laughs> You got, we are like, we are dueling. Like, okay, well, so mine is, I'm in a, clearly in a child's room. <laughs> and you're in a messy kitchen. This I am. Perfect. And you might hear my, my little pug run by and like snort oh. and my other dog's going to bark because I got kicked out of my little office when my son moved back home. So it's, um, you know, I, I, Glamorous. I have to tell you, I fell down a podcast rabbit hole listening to your, your podcast. I was you did. crushing on you. I'm like, Oh my God, your blog, your podcast. I mean, Randy, I'm so happy to get to chat with you. It was so awesome. fun. So oh good. So you know, so you know how I can swear and be dark because I sometimes when I'm on people's podcasts, I was on one and she goes, I'm really hoping to not get an explicit rating. So um, do you think you could not swear? And so then when we started the recording, I said, I just want all the listeners to know that I have been told I'm not allowed to swear and I cannot I cannot vouch for what's about to happen. What? There's no fucking swearing on this podcast? Uh, what? <laughs> no, you're fine. Like, go for it. I figure if we get to live in this much pain, we get to fucking swear, right? Like, yes. there has to be some upside, anything. Exactly. And it doesn't have to be all the time, but, like, if it feels right, you can't censor. That's okay. I'm glad we're on the same page on that. We are so on the same. I kind of feel like it's, like, the one, like, valve release that you get. Like, you can, yes. like, just kind of, like, go, okay, it's it's not a painkiller, but it is something that releases the the growl. So, yes, now exactly. you get to swear on this podcast. You get to be as dark as you want on this podcast. Okay. I we can um, talk about poop and bowels. We can talk poop, bowels. We can talk politics. We can definitely discuss parenting and chronic illness. We can discuss sex and chronic illness. We do have a sex therapist who comes on once a month to talk about I sex and chronic illness. I listened to one of those episodes. Yes, I was on a walk, and I was like, oh, let me get a feel for this. And I was like, I, I even just the fact that there was a like, – I get so moved by the littlest things, but even the fact, I think when he was first starting to talk about it, how, you know, with a chronic illness, like you might not feel sexy or like you have the energy to do that. I think I was like tearing up, like, I feel so seen. (laughs) Oh my God. I I can't tell you how many times I'm either like laughing so hard. I think I'm going to hurt a kidney or I'm crying when I'm talking to Dr. Phillips because like, (laughs) you know, like I think even just like, let's just get back to the basics of being a human being. And you and I are both in very similar situations of being sick moms and just like being a mom or even just being a person trying to move through this world as an adult, feeling sexy is often like really low on the bar. And um, yeah, so and then you add on any of the, you know, put in quotations, grossness of chronic illness and all of the (laughs) the absolute bullshit we (laughs) have. to deal with it. It's like, I, I guess my, it's like more of like a uh, cosmic horror grossness because I just locate <laughs> by moving. So if anyone wants to use their imagination on what sex is like, um, yeah. go for it. <laughs> it is exactly what you think it's like. <laughs> is that, is that, is there somebody that has a kink like that though? Like hopefully your partner, right? <laughs> uh, I, I have to say my partner is probably the least kinky person ever. <laughs> I used to uh, call him Mr. Rogers when we were friends. So that gives you a general like, picture into my life but uh yeah right. it's oh no we can absolutely discuss anything you want I went through your like your uh listen to like your first few episodes of your podcast I'm like oh this is this is gonna be fun so let me just put a little disclaimer for everyone listening right. um if you find me shrill annoying or too political you're gonna want to move on from this episode because I think that we are very similar in our views and what we're going to be talking about so hey if this is not your episode no worries You can move on, but I can tell you right now, I'm just going to give you all just a general idea of what we're going to talk about. We are definitely going to be discussing sex. We're going to be discussing uh, parenting with chronic illness. We're definitely going to be discussing the fact that you were a doula and you have, like, I have lots of things to chat about. (laughs) (laughs) So we're going to talk birth stories. Um, We're definitely going to be discussing politics. Um, (laughs) We're so going to talk politics. Um, Okay. okay. Yeah. So just to give you all a general idea of what we're going to be talking about, that's that's pretty much what it's going to be. So if this isn't your thing, um, Eva's got two podcasts a month on this channel, so you can move right along. All right. Anyway, (laughs) so (laughs) for Andy, this is probably the longest intro ever for a podcast, (laughs) but you run an incredible podcast. Um, You are dealing with if I understood right, I had I know kidney stones, but you also have like bowel resection. Is that right? Yeah, um, I had parts of my bowels removed when I was 16. But fun story is I didn't know that they took out these parts. They just 
I was just told like your intestines were telescoping inside one another. So we, I had to do this big, like life save life saving surgery, but then, you know, cut to like 20 years later of having all of these mystery problems. I go back in for another colonoscopy. And then this time my GI doc is like, Hey, so did you know that they took out your ilium, your cecum and your ileocecal valve? And I was like, no, those things sound kind of important. Okay. I don't know. I have no, they sound important. Why are they important? <laughs> well, not to get too much in the weeds and some of this stuff, like my brain as a mom uh, and maybe as somebody with a chronic illness, like whatever I don't need to have, I just purge. So sometimes there's things like I should know the answer to that, but I've, I've like moved it to store other data, right? <laughs> okay, so so these parts, um, a couple of things that they do is one of them is... Um, it absorbs B12. And that's like, I think the only place, I believe it's the ileum that that's the only place that that gets absorbed. So no wonder I've been like tired for my whole life. Uh, but then also like one of the major things it does is you, when you process fats in, if I, I'm, I'm not even going to say which one it is cause I know I'm going to get it wrong. But in one of those, what happens is you have bile acids that help you break down the fats and then they get reabsorbed in, I think it's the ileum. Um, and then your body's like, cool, this is working. But then when you don't have that part and these bile acids don't get reabsorbed, they go to your colon and then your colon's like, what is this? Like exit, abort, move this out. So that leads to fun, like chronic urgent diarrhea. And also you can imagine, I mean, my friend and I were joking the other day that I have failure to thrive, that like nutrients for me are just so hard. So we were talking about people nutrient shaming me, which looks like somebody coming up to me because I weigh about 98 pounds and I'm five, six and I don't want to be this size. I, if I could be, if I could have margins and have resources and nutrients, I would do it, but I have these issues. So people like to come up to me and go, oh my God, you're so fit. How are you so fit? And the funny part is, is I don't think I look fit. I think I look pretty fucking skinny. So it's like this weird, so immediately I know somebody that says that to me like is warped and has like a warped idea of what beauty and fitness is. But anyway, um, so I've now gotten to the point where I tell people instead of just going like, oh, yeah, I'm just skinny, is I say, well, I'm missing parts. I'm missing the parts that process fats. And then everybody starts to feel like they shouldn't have said the thing, which is right. That is the right feeling to have. My body is not for you to comment on. Even if it's positive, you may think it's positive, but now we're in a conversation about how often I shit urgently. So <laughs> anyway, <know>, I, <laughs> I have a rule and I just want to put it out there for everyone else to maybe take advantage of this rule. If someone cannot fix it in five minutes or less, you don't comment on it. So if there's a booger hanging out, you can always comment on that. If mm. a fly is unzipped, go ahead and comment on it. But anything else that can't be fixed, no reason to actually say anything. Oh, I love that. Yes. Well, and then so that so there's that part, um, and then there's also I think that now we're talking about the um, cecum, uh, and I, if I have them totally backwards, and somebody who knows the intestinal tract is like this lady is an idiot. I just apologize too profusely, but um, there's this there's this fun little valve that keeps the bacteria from your colon out of your small intestine. Well, apparently when they were fixing me, you know what was it, 25 years ago, they took that flap out. So there's a thing called SIBO or SIBO, however you want to say it, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth. Um, and it makes you nauseous and have awful poops and feel pretty terrible and give you depression and all sorts of things. So my GI doc was like, you will have that on and off your whole life because you don't have the door that blocks that. I'm yeah. sorry, and if you're watching this on YouTube, you're just seeing my eyebrows raise. Mm -hmm. I've had that once in my life, and I've had a lot of health problems, and I've never been so ready to just be done in my life as when I had that. So yes. that you are dealing with that over and over again is just like flooring me. I can't believe you have to go through that. That was like the worst year of my life. Like, And I've gone through a lot of bad ones. That was awful. Oh. So yeah, empathy, it's, it's, it's all bad. the empathy to you. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, well, and so I'm, you know, all of that stuff, it's like I go, I vacillate, like I would imagine a lot of people with chronic illness do. I vacillate between I'm going to find the thing, I'm going to find the foods I'm supposed to eat, but, but, and then you find yourself like, maybe I just need to accept this. Like maybe I need to not fight it. So I'm always going between fighting it, fixing it, making it, you know, finding the magic bullet. And what if I just accept this? Will it actually be better? And because of the memory thing that I told you about, I have to relearn this like every year and I've gotten to the point where I start taking notes 
about like, okay, the last flare that I had, here's what I did. And then at the end of it, I will say like, the food isn't the thing. It's like it, when you get, cause what, what'll happen is I'll try to follow the SIBO diet. But then what's funny is my GI doc is a vegan. So she wants me to follow a vegan diet. But then I get kidney stones because I've been chronically dehydrated for years with, you know, constant diarrhea. Then the kidney stone diet. So I can't fucking eat anything is basically what all of these things say. And you can imagine the fun mental spiral it is to open the fridge and look at everything and go, nope, can't, nope, nope. And being somebody who's small anyway, I just so I relearn every six months to a year you just have to eat what you want to eat because the happiness that that brings you and the non micromanaging is more important than whatever thing you think is on a different diet. And then, then I do that until I have another episode and then I, and then repeat. So it's fun. It's really, really fun. <laughs> I, do you get the, um, I, I'm just curious cause I'm like this, but do you get the, um, susceptibility to snake oil where it's like, all of a sudden, like you've been doing everything you can be to be the good chronic illness patient and do everything your doctors are saying and nothing's working. And then someone's like, well, if you just did, and then whatever that next sentence is, like I get super susceptible to that. I might've tried it five times before, but I'm like, oh, this time, maybe I didn't do it good enough for her. Yes. So yes, case in point. So when I'm at my lowest, I find myself, you know, after an episode where I'm up all night in the toilet, and then this was like maybe a month ago, I thought I, I'd had like six months to nine months that were pretty great. And then all of a sudden, I could feel the SIBO symptoms. And so I thought, Oh, man, I've taken it too far. I've taken that eat whatever you want thing too far. I don't know what I've done. So I'm on the wet, I'm on the internet researching and I find this specific SIBO breakthrough by Dr. Amy Myers, MD, and she's like an MD and a holistic, which so that to me is already like, I love you because you realize the flaws of Western medicine, but yet you will utilize them. But so, so $300 later at two in the morning, I've purchased this 30 day like cleanse thing. And I, I go to do it. And there's some of the herbs that are actually, I think doing, doing well, but I get this like 30 day supply of protein powder. So I start making it. I don't even like protein shakes, but I'm like, this is the thing I'm going to do. So it's paleo. So it's, it's a protein shake that's made out of like cow. I don't know, but I smelled it and it smelled like, Oh, that's delicious vanilla. And then the second I blended it, it smelled like vomit. And so that was that it was like, it was done. It was started and stopped within 24 hours. <laughs> So yeah, I'm susceptible to all that stuff. And then I won't think about it for a while because I'll think, you know what, not thinking about it actually makes me feel more healthy. But then there'll be something that'll come in, some new thing. Well, did I try turmeric yet? I mean, did I really try it? Have I really, did I take the right capsules? Like, yeah. There's this like almost, um, I, I, please don't bother writing me about how offended you are with what I'm going to say because I, I don't mean to be offensive <laughs> with what I'm going to say and I'm sorry I'm, I'm like in a world of pain I have a completely dislocated leg so Aww. I'm just trying to grab for the words and it's going to be messy today so forgive me everyone or don't um, but mm -hmm. it's almost like a, a religion um, of like so you're never going to be good enough you're there's always going to be like this like martyr perfection up here of like the perfect chronic illness person and you're never going to reach it and it's almost framed as it's your fault for not being able to reach it like it's your fault for not being able to follow this ridiculous diet upon diets like four diets at once and then taking all the supplements and then you know it's like that's like already a beyond 80 hour week job and then you add in like a life <laughs> or well, and adulting. kids <laughs> oh you know if God. I didn't have kids <laughs> I, and I just, it was like, I just focused on me. I mean, it would probably be awful because I would probably be even more obsessed about it. But I mean, I, I like, like all of us, I have a supplement graveyard. And so it's funny because uh, like I said, okay, are you the able thing? to throw them out though? I'm just curious. That, like, are, I, I'm into minimalism. I know the be behind me does not look like minimalism, but I, I'm like totally obsessed with it right now. And I still can't get myself to throw away the ones that didn't work. Are you able to? Yes. No, I'm not <laughs> totally because because what I said about I relearn every year, oh, it's like, oh, turmeric, I didn't really give that a chance, but I actually bought that. Oh, and then I go and I go to the graveyard and I exhume whatever supplement uh, I, I have I a need. minute for like supplement zombies because yes. this is, this is and then slaying. And then I take it for a week and I don't feel any different. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I remember why I did this. Put it back in the graveyard, exhume a year later. Like it's, it's, it's totally ridiculous. But I mean... I lately have been, 
so the, the diet thing for me is probably one of my biggest issues is I have a GI doc and I picked her because she was a vegan, not because I'm a vegan, but because I thought a doctor who understands that food has some part of it or who thinks out of the box at all, I want, I want that sort of a doctor. But <laughs> as you would imagine, it's like most of the time I'm there, it's talking about how I should be vegan. And then every time, well, anytime I try to go vegan, then I have other issues. So it's like, like you said, that never good enough. It's like, I can never, when I fix something with one thing, then another thing happens. So yeah, I can be vegan, but my calorie intake is so much less. So I lose weight that I don't have to lose. So then I eat something else. And then it's like, I can never quite get the balance right. So I'm just at the place where I just did this like week long boot camp for anxiety because I have anxiety related to this health stuff that trickles into other things. And when my health is good, I don't have any anxiety about it. But when it's bad, it's bad. And so one of the things that I've been learning that's kind of like blowing my mind is this idea of letting a bodily sensation come over you and just noticing it and not trying to fix it. And one of the things that they said that, that this therapist, it's, it's by the guy who wrote the book Dare, um, it's a book about anxiety. It's so good. It's so, it's got, it's so good. But he, uh, the, the woman that's working with him said, you know, the, the people who come to me who have these kind of anxieties, but I think it was specifically maybe about the health. She goes, you guys are the fighters. You're the warriors. You're the researchers. You're the type A's. You're the overthinkers. And so she goes in a nutshell, what this dare program is or what trying to get rid of this anxiety is, is learning how to do nothing. And so that like resonated huge for me because I'm a go-getter, I'm motivated, I, you know, I have ideas and I go for them and if I can fix things, I will. And so she goes, it's just, it's the simplest thing is when your stomach feels weird, you just, my stomach feels weird. And then you keep going. I mean, there's, there's this whole plan that they have where you try to actually engage the feeling to, to stop what's happening in your nervous system. So they talk about diffusing it with thoughts, but then also running towards it. So when you feel it, you're supposed to feel the sensation and kind of say to your body, okay, what else you got? Bring it. Because that tells your nervous system, we're not scared of this, which then doesn't fuel a panic attack. So it's like you almost are looking for it. So the challenge is you spend a week looking for these things and being excited about them. But being excited is different than being anxious about them. So anyway, that's, that's like a whole other thing if people want to want to check it out. But just that idea of what if I was somebody who didn't have to fix everything? Then I could have these feelings and just keep going with my life. So in the past couple of days when I've had, you know, nausea or stomach thing and just think, there's that and keep going. And it's, it's kind of been nice. Like for example, today I went to the bathroom and it wasn't great. And normally I'm like, Oh, was it the gluten? Was it the dairy? Was it the, and I'm going through the whole list. And did I, mm, I wonder, was it from two days before? And this time I just went to the bathroom. It wasn't great. And I thought, huh, sometimes people will go to the bathroom and it's not great. And I like thought no further on it and just went and ate whatever I wanted to eat. Not saying that's a fix for everybody, but I thought that was pretty groundbreaking. <laughs> I'm just trying to hold the, maybe I don't have to fix everything. Like, just, you know, health, yes. Life, also a question mark. Parenting, huge thing. We're like, like, there's been a big discussion in the house because, like, I have scar tissue inside my mouth and, like, biting my cheek from not trying <sighs> to fix my teenager's problems. Yeah. That's like, that's like... I think that just kind of like permeates everything in your life. If you're someone who's like, I can fix this. I should fix this. It feels bad in my soul and heart not to jump in and fix this. Like, exactly. Like letting go. I mean, it's so dumb. And this is one of those things like, you know, if we were talking about this and some person came by and was like, you guys should just try letting go. We'd be like, I'm going to slit your throat. <laughs> like, but, but, you know, being in it, I was on this call the other day with like 15 other people, you know, who were, who have anxiety and this lady was telling us this and we were all just like, I mean, I know me on my computer, I was just almost in tears thinking, yeah, she has me pegged so well. And why do I feel like I have to fix it? And I know it's because I was telling a friend this weekend, I genuinely worry that there's something bigger going on or that I'm not going to make it very long. Like, so I know if this is what I feel like at 42, ain't no fucking way I'm around at 80. Because that's a woman just shitting herself in public all day, every day. 
And I've like told my family, like, maybe give me, maybe, maybe just give me whatever potion to just make it so that I'm not living that life. But that's a real anxiety that I have about, I don't know what this looks like in 10 years and 20 years. So I don't know, maybe that gives me, I mean, it doesn't fix, it doesn't fix that worry, but maybe it makes it so like, if I'm going to die at age, let's just say, if I'm going to die at age 65 anyway, maybe I should not spend my life trying to fix it. Which is hard because then you're also like, but what if we could fix it? Like the, there's always the thing. I got an email this morning about like how to know if your thyroid's messed up. And I thought, I'm not even, I'm not going to look at that because I'm going to try to just believe that I'm, I'm, I'm fine enough. Ugh, it's so it's such a rub though. It's so finding that middle ground because there's times where you're like, if I if I don't look for this, and if and maybe there is something that can take this misery away or that can make my life longer, and you won't know it if you don't go after it. So I mean, all this is to say, like, there I don't know. It, literally, this podcast is to say I don't know. Like, just <laughs> if, if you're listening to this, this is not for. Obviously, we are not doctors, so this is not a podcast for, like, getting information. This is a podcast of this is what we're all dealing with. Yeah. And don't feel like maybe you're so alone if you get to hear what other people are, are dealing with. I think it's really interesting, the idea of, like, instead of trying to fix your life, living your life. Yeah. And, like, you know, I think a lot of us have that mortality, you know, some more than others. Like, some of us definitely have a, a definite timeline. Others of us just are like, okay, <laughs> You know, if this is middle age, I can't imagine how this is going to progress. So I think we all have like these uh, alarm clocks going in our heads of like, okay, okay, okay. And with all these crazy symptoms, there's also the fear of, well, what if I miss a big one? Like, that's right. That's that's definitely my fear. Like me and a couple of my other friends who have chronic illness, we always joke about. I think when I die, they're going to like open up my body, and there's they're just going to be like, oh my gosh, it was riddled with you know, something, because it's like, sometimes there's so many symptoms that it feels like there must be something bigger here. But like, I don't know, what if, what if we wake up believing there's not something bigger? And that's been sort of my in the last week of doing this anxiety boot camp thing. I just keep thinking, so many times when something happens, my brain immediately goes to what is this? What does this mean? What's the bigger picture here? What do I need to be doing? And I'm going to try to limit that until I forget and then have to do the pay $100 again for the boot camp and then relearn it. Uh, but that's kind of where my head is at right now trying to deal with this is by not trying to deal with it. Like this isn't like managing my chronic illness is maybe something I'm just going to take a break from and see what happens. That's a really cool experiment. I am, I'm really curious how that goes for you. I, I've done yeah. it too. I like, I've stepped out many when I was, it took 20 years to 30 years to get a diagnosis. Oh. So I would just step out of Western medicine for like years at a time and be like, I, I can't even see a doctor about this because I can't have yes. another white coat anxiety attack with someone going, you're so healthy though. All your blood tests yeah. are negative. You're fine. You're just nervous. Like I couldn't do oh. it. So it was just, um, yeah, I get the like just stepping out and being like, I, I, I can't do this part of my life right now. Yes, exactly. And I mean, this is reminding me of the like white coat, everything's fine. I have this funny story of um, when I was, you know, when I was 18 years old and I was in college, I was starting to get some of these symptoms and it was after my surgery. And so I went in for this colonoscopy. I don't know if you've ever had a colonoscopy, but like the prep part is pretty awful. You just poop all night long. And so you're wiping all night long. So I'm thinking, so I go to the thing. And then, the, I mean, the worst, honestly, the worst part is getting in the car that morning to go to the colonoscopy place. And you're like, how do they, I'm going to like, like towels, diaper. It's just because you just don't know. So anyway, get the colonoscopy done. Um, Afterwards, I'm hoping this lady says, you know, the thing we all want, which is here's what we found and here's how to fix it. And it's easy. Right. So I'm hoping that there's something. So she comes out, you know, I've been wiping all night long. So she comes out and she goes, you know what? We really didn't find anything except an irritated anus. And I was like, well, wait a minute. I took the prep which gave me the irritated anus so that then you could go in and tell me I have an irritated anus. Like that to me was just the mind fuck sometimes that all the testing is. And I thought, this is bullshit. I'm not doing this ever again. And so it wasn't, let's see how many 20, it wasn't till like 20 years later 
that I got another colonoscopy. So that doctor missed that there were resection lines around the parts that I was missing. So had she noticed that, maybe I would have at least known what was happening to me. But I just, I will never forget the feeling of being told you have an irritated anus when, you know, that's that's what the prep gave me. It just, yeah, you have to have a dark, see, this is the thing is you can't have your bowels removed without your consent and also have doctors tell you you have an irritated anus without like having it make you be really dark and <laughs> strange and quirky. So am I thankful for it? Maybe. Maybe it's made me this unique, eccentric human being. I don't know. I'll never know. I, we're just like, you know, little creatures that are, are made up by our experiences and our biology. It's uh, <laughs> Yeah. I, I just, so you've said a few times that this is something that happened without your consent. I, I'm, how did this all come about where you had to have this emergency surgery as a teenager? Yeah, so I was 16 and all of a sudden I was getting these stomach aches and they wouldn't go away. And I remember lying on our dining room floor and just like writhing in pain. And I'd never had anything before that. I never had a broken arm. I didn't know anything. So my mom gave me milk of magnesia and I barfed it all up. And then it was like, finally, I think my mom realized that I was in such pain that we had to go to the ER. So in the ER, they did all sorts of really invasive tests, especially when you're 16 and you haven't ever been, ever, haven't ever had any healthcare really. And you're like, oh, they can like go through all those routes. So like I had a barium enema um, for the first time at 16, which I, I mean, this will come as, as not as a shock to anybody, but when I finally went back to school, I did a stand up report on what it was like to get a barium enema in my English class. So I just, I've always had this, like, if I'm going to go through this really awful, awkward thing, like you're all going to hear about it sort of thing. I'm just so, so impressed with you. Like when I was 16, the idea of anyone finding out I was human at all, a pimple, like mm. that I went to the bath, like that would have just horrified me. Like to have any like human thing showing like this whole idea mm. of like the perfect Right facade. Yeah, right? That was yeah. so intense. Like, I'm so proud of you, like, the 16-year-old <laughs> you, to be like, oh, fuck that. This happened. It was traumatic. Y'all are going to find out about it. Like, that took yeah. me to, like, 40 to get there. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I've always been kind of like that, and I don't know what to attribute it to. Um, but so then awesomeness? I. <laughs> <laughs> and so I don't know. So I had the I – ha so they finally figured out what it was. I went in for the surgery. I remember my mom and the doctor prayed over me, which I was like, well, that that's not good news. If somebody's praying over you again, Especially a doctor, all new things. Like, the right? Doctor. <laughs> Although I was like, thanks for the good vibes, you know, in, in hindsight. But then, and then they put you out. And I mean, when you're 16, you don't know what anesthesia is. So I'm just like, this is, this is like, an, this is an amazing acid trip of some kind. So then I, I, they, they, apparently how they said is they took all my intestines out and undid them and then put them back in. So, and while they were in there, this is another interesting piece. While they were in there, they, they decided to take my appendix. And the reason for it was, is I have my scar is like what would look like an appendectomy scar. So they said, if you're ever in an accident and like unconscious, the paramedics are going to assume that you don't have an appendix. And if your appendix is burst, they wouldn't know that. So we took it out. Like, what? <laughs> so, but I'm 16. So I don't know. And my parents, you know, that was back in the day where you didn't like Google things. And my parents were just kind of like, we love this doctor. He's a brilliant doctor. Well, it turns out that doctor didn't find a growth I had on my bowel that was causing it. So about a week after I'm home and recovering, I start to feel the pain again. And I'm like, oh, no, go back in. The whole thing had gone back to itself. So they had to reopen me up and do it again. So then finally it worked. But when I say non-consensually, like, you know, in this day and age with how I parent my kids, like I would be asking questions. I would be like, what, you know, so what, what did you take out? Were those parts important? What did you do? What can we expect for her, her life to be like? How will she be affected? What does this look like in adulthood? And my parents, I mean, they were doing the best they could. And back then, I don't think you advocated like that, but um, they were just like, okay, great. And we never had a follow-up appointment. Like, it was just like, okay, everything's like fine. So that's why they didn't tell us what they did specifically because my mom actually is super organized and takes tons of notes and we've been through it and there's nothing about it. Um, so I just, I feel like I got burglarized in a way, you know? I, I, I want to do an episode so much on uh, medical PTSD because, you know, like we talk a lot about consent, especially now in this day and age. Thank God. I'm so happy for those discussions. But right. also going into like the, like, 
the amount of physicality, like you're talking about like orifices that you're like, Hey, <laughs> and it like, I remember like when I was 16 and I almost died and they were like, Oh, mm-hmm. we're going to go and do a, um, we're going to get the fluid right from your kidneys. So it's like up a urethra. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Oh, like, right. <laughs> and yes. it was all so dramatic and you know, was, like, we're almost exactly the same age. And it was like not mm-hmm. a time where people were even asking like, Oh, you're 16. Maybe you've gone through some things. So like I had gone yes. through a lot of things. So that was super traumatic. So like, I really want like to have like a discussion about like this, this medical PTSD. I know doctors and nurses, especially in emergency situations are doing the best they can, but there's gotta be some, some also handholding compassion that can happen as well and better explanations. Like (laughs) Exactly. And that's why in some of the birth work that I did as a doula, you know, it's, and part of the reason why we get burned out so easily is we see so much stuff that is that is not that, that is not consensual, that is not kind and compassionate. And to be the person watching it, and really my role as a doula was not to step in the middle of that. I tried to give comfort measures to my client as much as possible and ask really stupid questions to help her know that she had choices on things. Um, but it's such a it's such a dance to do that. But I mean, the medical world seeing how they go in and do things is just um, it's really really disheartening. So yeah, to be somebody who's been on the receiving end of that, and back then I didn't even know. I mean, like now when you're talking about it, I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. Like I had I had things that were inside me that I had never had inside me before. Like that's probably an interesting situation to have. And I remember. I remember being so nervous about, I remember one of my fears was being at Target or Mervyn's, places I shopped the most when I was young for clothes, and having the fire alarm go off and being naked in the dressing room. Like, I remember feeling nervous about that, but then I went through this surgery and I was walking down the hall with a gown on with my ass hanging out and I didn't care. And so there's this, you know, there's this initiation you go through when you go through this kind of thing that then nobody maybe talks about. I know my parents, like, we didn't have a talk about, like, the things you went through no 16-year-old should have to go through. Um, and, again, it's not a dig on them, but it's just, you know, it's just different times. So hopefully some of that stuff exists now for people to know they're not alone and to process some of that. Yeah, and also, you know, we we came of age before Google. Like, we, when we were when we were just, like, coming up through all this, um, AOL was a new thing, and we had yes. dial-up internet. I know young people. You actually had to plug a phone line into your computer. And, and it you took forever. And the phone, <laughs> and you heard something that if you are old enough to remember Skrillex, cats mating. That's basically what you would have to listen to on this fucking app. So it wasn't really the ability to like really get all of this information. Like right away, there's like no, you know, Mayo Clinic online. And it was, right. you know, you'd have to go to this, like, as I'm over in the Bay Area, you'd have to go to Stanford law, uh, Medical Library and start researching. Yes. Yeah, it wasn't as easy to access things. But in a way, it's like, was that better? Because we weren't obsessed. Like I think about after I, I mean, when I was in college and all those things, I had symptoms and issues, but I just didn't obsess about them. And maybe it was because they back then I was only looking out for me. So I didn't have two kids to take care of and all and, you know, all the weight of being a responsible adult. But, you know, I wonder there's sometimes I wish we went back to the way that things were. But I know I know overall there's a lot of gains we've made, but it's like I feel like either way has its pros and its cons. So speaking of responsible adulting, um, <laughs> I, I get to hear a lot from people who are um, like, oh, God, I don't know how you would do like this, all of the sick with kids. And I, my yeah. answer is always, I don't know how you do it with that. Like, I, I need like be that dog, cat, something to, you know, get me to leave the bed. And like, I end up being able like this yeah. morning, I was like, oh, I'm gonna have to cancel this interview. There's no way my leg is hanging out of its socket. And I ended Aww. up doing grocery shopping and getting everything done and <laughs> getting wow. child off to school. It's like amazing, like how much, you know, when, like you had written in your show notes, like, um, it's amazing what you can actually get done when you, you have to, <laughs> like, there's mm-hmm. no not um, if there are smaller people who are relying on you to get done. So how about you? Like, how do you feel like the whole, like, adulting kid responsibility thing weighs in on? (laughs) Because I know it can also be a lot on the other side of, I just can't. And yours are small, aren't they? Um, Mine are, I have a 12-year-old and a 6-year-old. Okay. So, um, gosh, I mean, it's like, it's, it's both things. So on one hand, I think to myself, if I just had to focus on me, then I could do the things that calm the nervous system, that make the vagus nerve, you know, more chill. I could do some of these things. I could get out and walk every day. I could have a meal, 
you know, that wasn't all scrambled. Cause for me, I think my whole life is trying to, to chill my vagus nerve. Um, so I think about how I'm so scattered and I have to show up for things. But then like what you're saying is when you have to do it, you have to do it. And so I appreciate it in that way. But I mean, it's, it's tough going and I'm really, as clearly, I'm really honest with people about it. So like this year, my daughter's in first grade and I was talking to the teacher about some volunteer stuff that I might want to do. And she suggested something that was in every Friday homework thing. And so I said, you know, I have some chronic health stuff, so I'm looking for something that's low obligation, low FaceTime that I can just eject myself out of if I need to, you know, cause I'm always the kind of person that would rather tell the people what's going on and so that I don't let them down so they know what to expect. So she was like, how about I have this one project you can do it whenever you want and it's once a month. And I was like, great. That one. So <laughs> yeah, I'll take that one. Um, and part of me is like, why am I even volunteering anyway? But I do like to get like my, my face in the class and just kind of like see who's who and all that kind of stuff. So, but I, I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's really fucking hard to parent with this. And I think motherhood in general is really, really tricky, especially modern motherhood and all the pressures that we have. You know, I mean, if, if you want to hear about that, you can check out my podcast, Adult Conversation, which is just basically all about the realities of that. But then, you know, sometimes I think maybe this isn't that hard, but I just have a chronic illness that makes it hard. So I had written an article about chronic illness. And one of the things I talk about that is I set my life up so that I can eject it at any moment so that my husband can be the closer on everything. So I Christmas shop in October and a little bit in November. I usually have that so that in case I get like last Thanksgiving, I got E. coli, which was super fun, right? So, and then one time, one the Christmas before, I think I had shingles um, and there's always a kidney stone, just like, I'm gonna drop, I'm gonna drop. So it's like, I'm just walking around like, I don't know when or what is gonna take me out. So I have to be very planner. Otherwise, I, you know, things won't happen. And I definitely am not the kind of person that everything has to be magic. And I tell my kids, I mean, my kids know about my stuff. And my son is super compassionate. He's a 12 year old. He'll do anything for me. And he's always like, Mom, is your stomach okay? Or if we if we leave to go to the zoo or something, and he can just like see on my face. He's like, is your stomach okay? Should we cancel this? Like my kids are so compassionate about it because again, I'm completely honest with them about it. But does that make me feel good? No. Is that the kind of mom I thought I would be? No. Did I think I would have to cancel plans because I feel like I'm going to shit my pants while we're there? No. But what else can I do? But, but, you know, do my best. And so if that's being honest with them about it, if that's setting up my life in certain ways, then, then that's what I do. But, um, I mean, I, I talk about this too in that article that I feel bad for my husband is who I really feel bad for because he didn't know he was signing up for this. And I didn't know I was signing up for this either. When we got married, I didn't know that this is what this was going to be like as it's gotten worse over the years. But I just sometimes like fantasize him marrying some like, like uh, just amazing strapping immune system woman who never needs a bathroom and they just travel the world together and he's so happy. I feel like you deserve that. And it's not from him. I mean, he's so supportive and he would take me any way, but I just, it's hard to not sometimes feel like, you know, like, you know, broken or like, gosh, wouldn't this just be better for everybody if I didn't have these issues? And then, you know, you have to realize, well, like, there's a lot ways, a lot of ways that this could be worse. So it's trying, trying to, trying to do the best and be honest, but also, you know, have to take, have to take a break when I have to take a break, which when they're little, like that was the hardest for me age, uh, maybe a year to four years is nearly impossible for me. And I don't know if it's my personality or chronic illness or both, but that's when you can't rationalize with people. And so you can tell them I don't feel well and they like hit you in the face with a Thomas train. So like, it just sucks for me. So, oh, did you just like pull something out? Yes. Um, we're going to ignore it though. Um, we are. Okay. Yeah. We are not going to try to fix it. Right. We're, we're, we're just going to let that arm just hang out of its socket. We can just, just be there. Aww. Um, no, it's, I call those years the maximum mobility, minimum common sense years. And it's like, they're constantly yes. trying to kill themselves. Like they are just like these little balls of like enthusiastic suicide where they are throwing themselves at moving cars, big yes. dogs. And you're like, I can't even stand up from the sand pit right now. Can you stop trying to eat the dog poop? Like just oh, stop. Yes. 
I don't understand. I don't like to me, the craziest thing is somebody who's so tired who won't sleep. Like I can't even wrap my head around that. I still, and I've been through it twice, but I still, I do not understand. And like people who don't eat, like who just are starving, you can tell they're cranky and then they will not eat the food. I am, I do not have I'm a lot sorry, of like my, my parenting PTSD is coming back. I'm starting to like have panic attacks. Um, no, like yeah. really like it's when my son was, um, I was pretty much on my own and I was sick and I was going to graduate school and he was seven months old and it was like, and we didn't oh have a God. diagnosis. We were just told that I had fibromyalgia and I'm, anyone with fibromyalgia, I'm sorry, I put the just in front of that. If fibromyalgia sucks, it bites unfortunately it's the least of what I have right now so it was just like and it also doesn't help you if you're dislocating and you don't know you're dislocating and so like yeah yeah, being there alone with with this really awesome kid but I don't have the brain um for staying at home I'm not a stay-at-home mom type I'm too snarky I'm too bitchy and I'm I'm too ADD so rolling a ball back and forth for an hour was like a level of emotional torture I have yet to experience since. <laughs> and um, I'm with you. Right? I'm with you. I didn't know that. Like, so, you know, you have these ideals about who you'll be. And I thought, oh, I want to be home with my kids. I want to, I want to raise them. That seems like the right thing to do. So I always joke that I think I was a working mom, that I pushed myself into being a stay at home mom and then like resisted it, you know, but it's like, it's that thing of parenting where the thing you want to do and the thing that you do do sometimes are two different things. Oh my God. Yes. And like, seriously, just like a quick sidebar here. If you are a stay at home mom and that is your jam, I bow down to you. You are an awesome human yes. being. Yes. If you are a working mom and that's your jam, awesome human being. Like this totally. is, I am all for choice and decisions. Like my cousin is like the best mother I've ever met in my life. And she loves staying at home with her kids and she is awesome at it. That's her thing. Yeah. And that's great. Um, but when you add the sick mom thing into all of this, it mm. just takes on a different shade. Cause it's like, well, I'm home. So yes. I guess I'm home, but I can't do all the cool mom things that everyone else is doing. I can't get it together to get crafts. I can't go make the cute little sandwiches I see on Pinterest. I can't like, see, my, that's all bullshit anyway. Right, I mean, yeah. for the people out there who make that, <laughs> fuck like, Pinterest like good for I'm you. obsessed, but fuck Pinterest. Um, yeah. Pinterest has ruined motherhood. You realize this? <laughs> Pinterest is part of the reason that we are all overwhelmed because people are trying to make lunches that they can take pictures of to post on pages this is this is the thing like our parents didn't have to deal with. Our moms never had to deal with. They put a fucking lunchable in and they called it a day and a squeeze it and you didn't oh and God, you were happy. Everybody was happy. I remember squeezes. <laughs> oh, they were so good, weren't they? The, the orange squeeze it. Thing, or the um, yes. Capri Suns where you always impaled the whole thing. Like you could never yeah. get a straw into a Capri Sun just exactly. like a little bit. So much fun talking to some of my own age. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and Fruit by the Foot, do you know? I mean, other people out there are probably like, well, yeah, Fruit by the Foot's still around. I didn't know this, but I was at my friend's house the other day. Fruit by the Foot still exists. Mm-hmm. That shit's so good. I, I, so this is partially like with my health stuff. I ate the worst food because that generation, you know, they thought like you could just microwave everything. I eat microwave French fries. Do you remember that with the, like the silver panel that you put in the microwave to crisp them? Okay, there were here, so many things quick, we ate that were bad. A little aside here for everyone who's like, of course your generation is sick. You all ate absolute crap. All right, so I was raised by hippies. And I oh, you were mean wheat germ. Hippies. Were you eating wheat germ while I was eating microwave fries? Cashew cereal because uh, Cheerios had too much sugar. So I lived on rabbit food. Um, so just all of y'all who think that we just ate shit and we were microwave to hell. And that's why we're like this. No, I am really sick. And I was like raised. I'm so lucky. My name is not like. Yeah, we'll just Moon, let you. star, sunshine, face. It might have been good. I could have dealt with that. But like, and I actually got to see the list of names that my parents came up with. Like my dad actually was at Woodstock. Like. <laughs> oh my god amazing right he actually was there yeah. there was proof he was there and my mom was a folk singer and is an amazing singer but yeah no I was raised on health food all the way through it is see so this is interesting because <laughs> I'll never know like you know because of that growth on my bow I'll never know where it came from so I just I'll never know so it's making me feel like well maybe that maybe that wasn't that but I grew up with so much of that kind of food and loved it. So then being a parent today where we like know better is so hard because my mom, I just look at my mom. I'm like, you don't know how easy you had it. You didn't know that food was, you know, a certain way, but you know, like your parents obviously did. But, um, that part in itself, the whole food thing is a trip. Like the food for myself with all my issues around it, with what it's going to do to me is hard enough, but then like kids. Mm -hmm. So like, okay. So then for making a meal. So when I make a meal for my family, my husband's a vegetarian. I am not. 
my son now who's 12 will eat pretty much whatever, which is great, but he wasn't like always like that. And my daughter basically eats salmon, fried rice and artichokes. That's like it. She's, she won't eat quesadillas, mac and cheese, pizza. It's so weird. So like the stress of planning a meal and making a meal that all of us can eat. And me, I'm always like not doing dairy, doing dairy, not doing gluten, doing gluten. Like I'm a mess. So I, you know, all of those meal plans that come around like blue apron, I'm like, you could not even handle us. <laughs> Like, give me, we need a meal planning that's just like, y'all got some fucked up eating. Like, we will, we will hit all of it. So whenever that comes out, sign me up. I'll pay whatever it takes that you put in like a profile for each person and their personality defects and so what they're currently I think you just eating. started a business. I, I, I really I feel like you just started a business. Like, uh, that that would actually be, I think, people would sign up for. And then if you could add, it's like, I am, anyone who listens, I'm political. <laughs> Go figure. Yeah. So it's also like all this, okay, now, was this killed humanely? Did it live humanely? Where did it come from? Am I, oh, for crying out loud, I've got to stop moving. Um, did it come from another country where it had to be shipped in? Am I supporting bad labor practices? Am I supporting bad environmental practices? Like I am having nervous breakdowns in aisles. Like going, <laughs> I was going to say, just imagining, you know, when we look at the back of something and we're reading like, okay, well, what's the sugar content? But is it the good kind of sugar? Because there's various kinds. But with that oil, that's a different name for that. And then, yeah, you, and you, haven't, even, you haven't even talked about the labor practice you haven't even gotten to the labor practices there was an app I don't know if it's still around but like two or three years ago there was an app where you could scan the barcode and it will tell you who they had given money to politically and I'm like we've jumped the shark even though I, I fully support that because <laughs> I don't want to give money to assholes I'm like then you're then you buy one product and it takes you five minutes to like know the morals of that product <laughs> it's too I, much I, it, it is like I do my best to be like, okay, this is not something I am willing to put my money on and support. But oh my god! So okay, last night just yeah. super feminist. Um, obviously, my husband yeah. was like, "You're having an anxiety attack. We should just watch comedians. Like, stop looking at the news. You've got to stop looking at Twitter now. Now, stop. Put it down. Let's watch comedians." So he puts on one male comedian after another. Where I just keep looking at him like, I don't want to hear another. My wife is not my favorite person joke. This isn't oh, funny. Right. And then he, I'm like, can we try a woman comedian? Can we try that? And the first comedian said, um, I don't want kids because I don't want to be a mom. It's not that I don't want kids. I just don't want to be a mom. I could be a dad. And I was like, okay, that's sexist. But I, I want to be the dad. I can promise you as involved, my husband is the most involved father I've ever seen in my life. It is not even close to what I would have to hit to be considered a good mother. Oh, at a hundred percent. I always say that I, I like, I'm looking forward to being a grandparent because I think it's similar to the dad role, but yeah, I want to be, I want to be the dad. It's like all the fun without all of the pesky micromanaging of, you know, food and yeah, in ingredients. He's never and looked at the ingredients and gone, maybe this contributes to ADD. Maybe we shouldn't give this to a child who might yeah. have ADD. Should we discuss whether we even get diagnoses for ADD? What about the yeah. IEP plans? How do we make sure they eat the right food at school to make sure we don't have any issues? Not once. And he's a very yes. small person. <laughs> Has this ever been in his like sphere of... Totally and he's the healthy one, and I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> like, There's so much behind that. I don't know if you listened to my podcast epi episode with Darcy. It's a she wrote a book called Moms, uh, Mothers, Fathers, and the Myth of Equal Partnership. And so it's all it's it was like you read it and you're like, this this is amazing. It's research about why men don't show up equally in the parenting partnership, and it will blow your mind. There's I, when I read it, I was like. There are so many things in here that I thought I was just crazy, but there's actual scientific research that backs up the way that this happens or how I'm seeing, you know, other, other men do these things. It will blow your mind. So, oh, her book, the name of it is All the Rage, Mothers, Fathers, and the Myth of Equal Partnership. And I did a podcast where I interviewed her and it was like my favorite thing ever because it had me so fired up. And it actually, I got so much feedback. People are like, I think this book saved my marriage, like literally saved my marriage. So, yeah, and I don't think it's ever a thing. Like my husband would do anything to make my life easier. Like, Mine too. And, yeah. But the thing is, is like someone wrote this and I think a lot of it, it goes back to when we we're talking about fix it, because I think that yeah. like, uh, anyone who has female appearance, like appears female, like there's this expectation that you will do everything you can to make everyone in the room comfortable. And yeah. to make everything fixable. And I, that same thing is not put on to anyone who presents as male. 
And so right. someone had like written this thing um, to her husband about like micro like managing project manager is a job. They don't do the job. So if I have to project manage and tell you to clean things, put stuff away, get these things from the grocery store, get these specific things from the grocery store, I am project managing and I can't then also take the time to do these other things. Like just the idea that like telling people what they need to do is a job in and of itself. It's been exactly. like, and then I realized I'm cruise directing my house where it's like, I'm also <laughs> the entertainment director. I am the one who makes sure that yes. everyone's happy that we have good things that we can do together as a family to bond as a family. Like that's also the job. And it's like, ah, that's a lot of jobs for a sick person. Like that's a lot of jobs for any person. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, not to come back to the idea of letting go, but at some point, you know, some of those things it's like we, and that's kind of with chronic illness. I feel like I, I have learned, I have to let go on things. Like I, it's not going to look a certain way or I can't hit all of the marks, but it's this weird thing with parenting and, and being raised as a woman. One of the things that Darcy talks about in the book that just, I was like, this is so true. She was talking about how her husband was going to take her, their girls on a trip. And so he says something to her, he texts her and is like, Hey, I'm going to, you know, the girls and I are leaving, you know, uh, maybe could you put some things out that or remind me of things that, that I should pack for them. And he and she was like, well, I mean, you could probably think of the things, right? So this is the, what you're talking about, like the the managing of the things. And so, um, so she says something. She goes, you know, I just felt like such an asshole. Like, what? I can't just help him with those few things. And so she was trying to get him to do the packing, but then he was asking her questions about what to pack. So basically, she was going to end up doing the packing anyway. And she found herself at the end of it, finally, just packing for him. Because she's like, I don't want to be a naggy wife that like just won't help him. But she said, isn't it funny that when he takes the girls away, I feel like I should, how did she say it? The whole point of it was that no matter how it was, she felt like she should do the packing. Like I'm trying to, I'm like, I'm getting it kind of wrong, but um, there was something about it that just so resonated. It was like, it was like she should pack because he's, taking them, which is a quote unquote favor to her. But then also she should pack because she's just the mom and the mom does that. Like there's no getting out of it. Like it always seems like we're the one who needs to do the job no matter what. And so her thing was like, I stopped doing the things. And I've since, I've since interviewed another mom, Marissa, that was my last episode about all the things that she doesn't do. She doesn't do his laundry anymore. And these are not, she's, and they all say, this is not as a fuck you to him. This is mm -hmm. as a self-preservation to me which is why would I do your laundry? Why can't you do your laundry? And all these other things that like my, my, my friend Marissa is like, I just, dinner's a mystery every night. Like we both, like I come in and I don't have it planned. So it's like, what are we doing for dinner? So I do think there is a certain level of those of us that are warriors and doers and fighters and fixers and type A's and all of that, where we have to not do the thing because then the thing won't be done. But then you have to ask yourself, well, what's the big deal if that yeah. doesn't get done? What if we don't have the full meal list that we then like have our Instapot and, and we do all the stuff and everyone has their appropriate meal that they wanted and like it, what if we don't like that's that goes back to you know what you were talking about about the like maybe it just doesn't have to maybe we don't have to fix everything maybe we just yeah. let it just be imperfect as I feel like there's this like uh, optimization thing that we're always trying to optimize our time, optimize our yeah. families, optimize the experience of childhood for our kids. And it's like, you know, childhood for a lot of kids pretty much just rocks without us stepping in and having the perfect princess or dragon or, you know, like paper mache birthday party, like where you know, like, like the, the Pinterest birthday party. Sorry, can you tell I've been on Pinterest too much? You um, need, like, you need an intervention, <laughs> right? You need Pinterest removed from your life. Because I tell you, that is part of the problem. It's the perfect, it's the perfect facade. And that is, is so much of it, which is this perfect facade. And like, think about when we grew up. I mean, it wasn't perfect. And there were definitely like some big things that, you know, could have been done differently, that would have been helpful. But all of the independence that we got and all of that. And, and so I try to do that with my kids. Like I, I taught my 12 year old to do his own laundry. And some of it is self preservation, which is, I may not be feeling well, and sometimes I don't want to do this, but but I think it makes them stronger and better in the long run to do to to teach them this stuff and to not just make every single thing perfect. Like the things I want to make perfect, which still you can't make perfect, are the emotional 
needs. Yeah. Like I always want to be there to have their emotional needs met, but all this other stupid shit, I'm not going to waste my time on that. And there's it so much matter. like parenting from bed you can do that are the emotional moments and things. But you know, like what pisses me yeah. off so fucking much is watching people get mad at millennials. And it mm-hmm. makes me rage because I'm like, first off, who the fuck raised them? Yeah. So if you're mad that people aren't adulting who are adult, yeah, need to look over at like who made everything, who's, who made the road ready for the kid and so the kid ready for the road. So exactly. first off, number one, uh, that's, that's a big thing. And number two is like, I still feel like this, all these magazines and Pinterest and all these things on how we're supposed to do all these perfect things and perfect life for the kids we are infantilizing children all the way through teenagers and then being shocked that they can't do anything for themselves. They can't do their laundry. They can't make food. It's like, oh my God, what were you doing? It's like, no, what were you doing that you were like holding this accountable that they should yes. get stuff done? Like by the time they're four, they can actually make a basic lunch. Like they can do yes. peanut butter on bread. That's possible. You know, totally. Like, it won't look perfect, but it could get done. <laughs> Yes. And you know, too, exploring this idea of what wounds are we parenting from? So I say this because I know my husband has, you know, has his own sort of wound that he sometimes parents from that's like a beautiful thing because he didn't have a father who was there and sane and safe. So for our kids, it's like I just know subconsciously that's always what he's doing. But the the flip side of that is he wants to do everything for them. And I grew up as a latchkey kid who was like, you know, doing my own stuff from such a young age that I can't imagine, like, I want my kids to be able to do the things that I did where I came home from school alone every day and just made my life happen. I mean, my parents didn't do homework with me. My mom didn't really cook that much. So I was making, I remember liking cooking, like all of these things. So um, I think that that's a thing too, is to ask yourself some of the question of, you know, what might be the, what might be the wound that I'm parenting from that I'm overdoing it that is not helping my child. And I think that like what you're talking about is treating them like children and wanting to do everything for them because we want them to know that they're loved. Like I think, you know, I think we sometimes go overboard on that. You can have your kids be loved, but also know how to do their laundry. Yeah. That's the thing is like, we need to maybe redefine what, what love and taking care of someone actually looks like and fostering independence can be an act of love. Like, exactly. How could they possibly learn if they like to make food unless they try? Like, exactly. My son this morning, he's 12, and he was like, oh, mom, will you, um, I'm going to go upstairs and brush my teeth. Will you get my lunch started? And, you know, I do, and I, I had just helped him with this project or whatever, so it's not like I'm like, you're on your own for everything, buddy. But I said, you know, you know how to pull, you know, you know how to pull the stuff out of the fridge the same as I do. Mm -hmm. So I said, go brush your teeth and then come back down and put it together. So, but I know if you, if you have this subconscious wound that you want your kid to think that they can depend on you, you go, oh yeah, I'll do it. Yeah. So it's like, it really is about checking our own shit sometimes before making those uh, parenting decisions. But you know, again, we do our best and we have our wounds. And so, and we're going to fuck our kids up in a way that we don't even know. One of my best friends who's 65, who has seven kids and tons of grandkids is like, oh, Brandy, the, the best part about parenthood is you fuck your kids up and it's in the way you didn't even see coming. So she's <laughs> like, you do all these things to not mess them up at all. But then when they're older, they tell you something and you're like, that wasn't even on my radar. So she's like, so just let it go. You're going to fuck them up. And just get excited for when you learn about which way it was. So, so I was like, that's nice. My <laughs> Relieving. Kid, my kid just hit adulthood, um, which oh. is shocking to me. But he's one of my favorite humans of all time. Still one of my favorite people to hang out with. Um, he's awesome. But he said something to me that really hit hard, um, which was, he was like, I wish that you had been more of a... Um, Oh, not focused. What sort I'm looking for? Not strict, but you know, like maybe strict, like more like these are the rules. And yeah. I'm not that I am. I was raised by hippies. I, I think this is pretty strict for me. So I, right. like, yeah. I don't know. I'm trying here. Uh, but I wasn't that mom. And I was like, God, you know, I'm sorry. I guess that might have been a little bit more helpful for you to have things really defined. He goes, yeah, but if you had, that probably wouldn't have been what I needed. It was like, 
that's fair because I feel like a lot of like where I fucked up in parenting is number one being exhausted and not being consistent because consistency mm-hmm. makes things easier. But if you're too sick to remember what you said, you're fucked. Um, right. <laughs> there's nothing you can do about it. And then the other thing was trying to parent from what I needed when I was growing up and being like, right. I didn't get this. I needed this. So I'm going to give it to you. And they're like, yeah, I don't need that at exactly. all. That hurts. So it's like, wow, this is all, you know, um, my, um, Mom took care of her aunt, and she was one of my favorite humans. And after she died, or when she was um, dying, she told my mom, you know, you're going to make mistakes, and I'm going to forgive you. Mm. And that has to be, like, the most beautiful statement I can think of for any relationship at all. Like, parent to child, parents to each other. Like, uh, you know, I also have an ex-husband, so, you know... To like to um, you know mixed family, just like you're gonna make mistakes, we're gonna forgive each other. That's how this has to go. If we're going to keep moving forward together. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. right. And like you and like you said, you know, there's always. I feel like sometimes we're screwed either way because, like you said, had you been a strict parent, then you know he might have been like mom. He might have come to you and said, "Mom, I just wish you weren't as strict." Yeah. And then you wouldn't have known. Like, well, if I did it the other way, you come to me the other way. So it's like I think the thing to accept is they're going to come to us mm-hmm. about something, and, and we can just be understanding. And go, yeah. That sorry, that didn't work out that way. Um, yes. Love you. Yes. I, I hope you just know you were loved. Or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Right. Yes. All right, we hit an hour, and I will kidnap you for the rest of the day. I know, and there's so much else I want to talk to you about. So I, I have stuff to say real quick for everyone, which is you have to listen to her podcast. Oh, oh my God. It is one of my favorite. Um, I will be obsessing. It's Adult Conversations. Uh, is that? Did I say that right? Yeah, Adult Conversation. Yeah, and I think on the thing, it's actually Adult Conversation Parenting Podcast. Yeah, that's but you can confused. find it. Uh, but if you go to our show notes on invisiblenotbroken.com, bro- um, it's the first thing you'll find. So you can just click on it and just go down a rabbit hole. I know I will be doing that for the rest of today. So please head on wow. over, listen to Brandy's podcast. I'm hoping I can convince her to come back on a more regular basis. Yes, to um, do more panels because uh, you have so many things you're an expert in that I think a lot of us are uh, struggling with. So I hope Mm. we can pick your brain more often. (laughs) Oh, thank you. This is awesome. Honestly, coming on this, I don't talk about this in this way. I talk about a lot of parenting and birthy stuff. But I am like when I was like, wow, I'm at, I, and even filling out your form, I was like, oh, my gosh, I get to talk about this side of myself. I never really get to talk about it in this way. So thank you for the opportunity for me to get to like process through this. Oh, God, I'm so happy that, that you were able to feel that way about it. Because there's there's so much that we kind of like put off to the side as being sick or as being wives or as being friends or as being like parents. Like there's so much and facets that get ignored. So I'm really glad you took the time to write out those. Those are our show notes. If you go over to the website, again, you get to read through all Brandy's answers. Um, so thank you so much for coming on the, the podcast. I hope we get to see you again soon. Yes, thank you for having me. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, kind of thing you can do is still go over to Apple Podcast. Uh, I think that still exists. I think iTunes is what went away. Hopefully I got that right. <laughs> um, leave stars, leave reviews. Yes, I do read all the reviews. Um, and I, I do take them to heart, but not too much. I still am me. There's not much I can do about that. So um, if you, uh, that's still the best place to leave reviews. Um, and uh, also, we have a blog. So please feel free to go over there and check that out. Um, until next week, be kind. Be gentle and be a badass.